words of power because we are kings and our words matter. Now we have a high priest who died and rose again, never to die again, who has gone behind the veil into the very presence of God. He has become our intercessor in the right hand of God. He is there for us. Promises, we have better promises. And he is the guarantee that our promises will come true. Remember, believing means believing in the heart and acting. If you believe, all things are possible. That shows it's a law, right? All things are possible to him that believes. So this is a law. Paul talks about it. I've told, given you examples about Jesus. Even in Paul, you have a lot of examples. Paul says, talks about how to get saved. He says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Romans 10, 9. And verse 10 says, Romans 10, 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He is now talking about a law of faith. People are saying, how do I get saved? How does salvation work? How can I be free from sin and Satan? How can I have new life? How can I be born again? He says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And you shall be saved. It'll work. He says. He didn't say come up here to this mountain. Meet me over there for a fasting prayer. Yeah. No. He said believe in your heart. And confess with your mouth. And you shall be saved. Faith is what pleases God. You know. We do fast. We do pray. And we do all, all those things. But that's for a different reason. You see we need to spend time with God to. Learn the things of God. That's, that's a different thing, you know. Some people don't want to please God by faith. Yet the Bible says that's the only way you can please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So they don't want to please God, but they want to trick him into giving him something. Giving them something. You don't want to please the man and you want to trick him to give you something? <laughs> so I'm going to fast seven days. Now you're trying to trick him. 
No, if seven days doesn't work, I'm going to do 21 days and he will give it to me. He says, don't play tricks on me because that doesn't work. What works is faith, you see. Maybe you need to fast to read the Bible, pray and spend time with God and so you can get really spiritually very aware and learn things and so on and that's all right. But, you know, don't, don't use it in the place of faith, you know. Faith is the thing that pleases God. You can even read it like this. I'm quoting uh, Hebrews 11.6 in that same uh, passage. Hebrews 11.6. 11.6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. I would suggest that you read it like this just for the sake of clarity. Instead of reading without faith it's impossible to please God, you can read it without faith it's impossible. Now you'll understand. Just stop right there. Because that's exactly what it is all about. You see, how are you going to get anything from God without pleasing God? God doesn't require anything from you, my friend. God only requires faith. He doesn't require seven days fasting from you. He didn't say, if you fast seven days, the Lord may look from heaven. No, he doesn't say that. He's not requiring anything from you. He didn't say, if you bring this much offering, I'll do that. No, 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 he didn't say that. He wants faith. He has done something, do you believe it? He has provided something, do you believe it? He has died, had, son, had his son die on the cross, do you believe what was accomplished through it? Do you believe what he has done? He has gone through a lot and done a lot, but do you believe? Where is your faith, he says. Do you believe it? And if you believe, he's honored, he's pleased. That's what he's looking for. And we say, I'll do this, I'll do that. I used to know a preacher, he would leave his house and come into the church on his knees, you know, on the ground. Actually, a good man, you know. He will come on his knees all the way to the pulpit. He thought that will please God. Martin Luther tried it and God told him, you are not going to come to me like this. Where did I say you should come like this? I don't want you to come like that. It's not you on your knees. It's Jesus leaving the glorious place that he was there and leaving his place and position and everything for your sake, coming down on this earth and hanging on the cross of Calvary and dying there, bearing your sin. That's what is going to get done. Not you climbing some stairs on your knees or coming down to church on your knees, you know. What pleases God is faith. There is another verse, wonderful verse. I can't skip this one. I thought I'll skip this just now because time is up, but I can't skip this one. We haven't even gotten into 11.1 yet. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to take off. I get excited when I talk about faith, you know. That's my favorite subject, you know. I can talk about it yeah, all the time. But we have all the time, you know. Come back next week, we'll talk, continue, right? But I want to I wanna say one more thing here. In Habakkuk, uh, no, uh, there is one statement that appears four times in the Bible. A wonderful statement about faith, and I want to remind you of that. That statement says, the just shall live by faith. Originally, Habakkuk said it. You find it in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. The just shall live by his faith, it says. And then what happens in the New Testament, Paul takes it and quotes it for his own reasons in Romans chapter 1 verse 17 where he's talking about salvation. He quotes about how salvation is through faith and he says the just shall live by faith. And then he quotes it in Galatians chapter 3 verse 11 where he's con contrasting works of law, work of law, the law of work versus the law of faith. He says the just shall live by faith faith in Galatians 3.11 and the fourth time it is quoted in Hebrews 10.38 just before Hebrews 11 after 38 there is one more verse verse 39 in 10th chapter of Hebrews then it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of not thing, things not seen but verse 38 in chapter 10 the author of the book of Hebrews some people say it's Paul some people say it's others but whatever it is, the author of the book of Hebrews says, the just shall live by faith. 
And then he brings it down to Hebrews 11 and says, now faith is. See, that's the connection. He started speaking about faith already. Now there is the connection. Now faith is. That's the way he begins. That word now connects chapter 11 to all the 10 chapters that has gone before. What does the 10 chapters say? Well, who is he writing to? He's writing to the Hebrew believers. That is Jewish people who had been converted to Christ. Who now started believing in Christ. They are facing problems from two sides. One is from the Jewish community which wants them to revert back to the Jewish religion. Right? And the other is the Romans, the pagans, the, the Gentiles that are around. And they also hate Christ and they are also persecuting and troubling them. The first persecution is from the Jews. So they have persecution from their own community as well as from the Gentiles. These are Jewish people who have become Christians. The Jews want them to revert back to Jewish religion. They said, look, are you believing in this Jesus who died on the cross shamefully, nakedly? He died there and you believe that he is the Lord. You confessed him as Savior and you're gathering together and worshiping this Jesus. You know what a great religion you have left? Jewish religion. Look who our leader is. He never hung on a cross like this. Our leader is the great Moses who split the Red Sea, brought manna from heaven, water out of the rock, did all those miracles, mighty hand against Pharaoh. He brought the people out. Moses is our leader. God spoke to people under Moses in the Old Testament times to the Jewish people, not to anyone. He spoke through angels. He sent angels and spoke to them. God gave covenant not to anyone else in the whole world. Only to the Jewish people, Abraham's descendants, God gave a covenant. And God gave promises. And uh, God, the covenant was a blood covenant, sealed by the blood. And the promises were given as part of the blood covenant. And there was a sacrifice. We have a sacrificial system where we kill lambs every day and sacrifice for our sins. And the high, we have a high priest, they said. See, you don't have none of these. You don't have Moses, you don't have angels coming, and you don't have a temple and a sacrifice, and the blood is not shed, and nobody's there for you to take the blood into the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it at the mercy seat so that God will be pleased to forgive you. You don't have any, you're losing out on all this by believing on this Jesus. You don't have the promises now, you don't have the blood now, you don't have the sacrifice now, you don't have any of these things now. So, why don't you come back and become a Jew again? So people are taunted with, this, with these things every day. They're made to feel like they've got something less than what they were when they were Jews. They're missing out on all these things. And the author says, no, 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 listen to me. He says, Jesus is greater than Moses. That's how he begins the first chapter. He is greater than angels. To which of the angels God said, sit at my throne, at my right hand. But to Jesus, you see, they say angels came and talked. We have Jesus, God who at sundry times spoke through various diverse means and methods has now finally spoken through his son. The revelation that we have is greater than all the other revelation. The covenant, they have the old covenant. We have the new covenant. It's called the better covenant with the better promises the sacrifice they only have bulls and goats we have jesus himself his own blood the high priest they have a high priest who dies often and when he goes into the temple you don't know when he's if he's going to come back alive or not if he's worthy and if he's sinless and you have to all the time find a new high priest but now we have a high priest who died and rose again, never to die again, who has gone behind the veil into the very presence of God. He has become our intercessor in the right hand of God. He is there for us. Promises, we have better promises. And he is the guarantee that our promises will come true. So you are not missing anything. You have stepped up higher, you have upgraded. Don't worry. This is the consolation he offers. But then he's thinking about the Roman persecution that is upon the Christians. And he says, they're persecuting you, troubling you, and you wonder what God has promised, whether it's going to come through or not, whether God will come through for you and all of these things. I'll tell you, God who has promised will do it. Don't worry. Have some patience. Wait patiently. You will receive the answer. Faith 
you know, you obtain the promises of God not only by faith but by patience also. Don't give up your faith. So in the last few verses of 10th chapter, he says, don't be unbelieving. God is not pleased with your unbelief. God is pleased by, only by faith. Don't give up. Don't backslide. God is not pleased with those who backslide. God is pleased with those who believe. And then he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then he comes down and, and says, by it the elders obtained a good report. By it the worlds were created. We understand that the worlds were created. And then he says, without faith it's impossible to please God. If you backslide, you won't please God. But if you believe, you will please God, he says. Are you there? <laughs> Talking about it like that, he brings them down to Hebrews 11. And he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There is a difference between faith and hope. The first line itself talks about faith and hope. Substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There is faith and hope in that line. Difference between faith and hope is this. Hope is something that has to do with the future. You always think it's going to happen. Faith is always in the now. It says it's mine now. Faith begins as a hope. And I've been sharing that with you for the last few weeks. Faith always begins in the form of hope. You begin to think, yes, I'm going to get it. Yes, I'm going to arrive there. Yes, it's going to be possible. Yes, one day I'll be delivered from all these things and I'll come out on top. That's hope. That's good. That's not bad. That's good. That's how it starts. That's how faith starts. When you hear the word of God, you begin to get hope. But then hope is not where you should stay because hope will not get you out of the problem. Hope is make, makes, you, makes your head look up. Suppose you're sinking in a boat. Your hope will make your head lift high, head, lift your head high and put a smile on you, but you're still sinking and still going down. It won't change your fortunes. But faith is different. You know what faith is? It's one step above that hope. Because faith is where you keep hearing the word of God so that the result is you end up saying, no, it's not going to happen. It's already mine. It's mine. God said, I have given you this land before they entered the land. He said, I've given it to you. It's yours. People will say, well, somebody else is sitting there. Never mind. It's mine. It's mine. What is faith? Faith is the assurance that it's mine. So this is the difference between faith and hope. Faith says, even before you have it in hand, even before you have your healing, even before you have your deliverance or victory or whatever you're looking for, before you have it in hand, before entering the land of promise, God said to them, I have given it to you. I have, it's as, as if it's done it. It's done that's why the Bible says, by his stripes, you were healed. Not you're going to be healed. Nothing wrong with you're going to be healed. That's hope. Hope you have hope. But the thing is, faith, what happens? That healing, you begin to read from the word of God and understand it, what happened on the cross and how Jesus took your sickness and, and uh, died so that you can be healed. When you keep hearing that, then you arrive at a point where he says, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I am healed. I don't see it now, but I am indeed healed. That's what faith is. Faith is the substance. Substance means there is substantial something to see. There is tangible something, material something to see. There is joy. There is peace. There is happiness. There is rejoicing. Because you now believe that it's yours. It belongs to you. It is, it is yours. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, evidence is the word proof. Some translations use proof. Evidence is proof, proof of things not seen. Now, suppose you bought a car and you came and you haven't brought the car yet. You paid for it and everything, now it's yours. But you haven't taken delivery of it, right? So you come and say, I bought a car. People say, where is it? They say, no, I don't have it right now. They say, don't lie to me. He said, no, no, I really bought a car. Believe me, I bought a car. He said, no, I don't see it. You didn't bring it, right? So you just take the receipt and show them. Look, 
It's got my name on it. I got the car. You know, I used to pastor in America, and I came back here. I got married and stayed here for many years. I never took my family or wife or anything, you know, none of them to the States. For 17 years, I never took them. You know, I just worked uh, continuously here. Never uh, had a chance to take them back. I would go now and then and preach there and so on. Some of the guys will, you know, kid me and, uh, and, and make jokes about it. They say, is he really married? I have not seen his wife, you know. Is he really married? I don't believe you because you never brought your wife, they say. So I take a picture and show them, look. We really did get married. You know, that's proof. You can't have proof for something that is not, that does not exist. Something must be real, then only you have proof of it. You, it is not possible to have a proof of something that does not exist. The Bible says faith is the proof, the evidence of things not seen. That means even though there is there are, even though this is a proof of things not seen, not seen does not mean that it does not exist. The word proof indicates to me that something exists in the unseen realm and my faith is the proof of what is existing in the unseen realm for me. My healing is there in the unseen realm. My joy and peace and happiness is there in the unseen realm. My victory is there in the unseen realm. My success is there in the unseen realm. The fact that I'll come up in life is there in the unseen realm. It is there. I don't see it, but it's there. My faith is the proof. I need the proof until I get the thing which I'm hoping for in my hand, right? After you get the car, you don't need to show them the RC book and the receipt and all of that to show that you have a car. You can show the car, right? You can actually show the car. But until the car comes, you need the proof. Jesus paid for it on the cross of Calvary. And this is the receipt. Are you there? <laughs> it's the evidence of things not seen. So there are things that are not seen. Some, for some of us, healing is not seen yet. Success is not seen yet. Prosperity is not seen yet. Today we have an empty pocket. We don't have prosper, but it is there. Not seen does not mean does not exist. Otherwise, no meaning for faith. Faith is the proof of things that do exist in the unseen realm, right? So we don't see our pocket and our wallet and our bank statement. We see this. Hello? A lot of people only looking at their pocket and Looking at their statement, this is a better statement, my friend. We have this. This will guide you into the possession of those things that are there in the unseen. Until you possess them in the natural, in the physical realm, this will guide you. You will land. See, some people think, how can, how, how can you say we have to believe in these things unseen and go by it? Well, when you fly in an aeroplane, you think the pilot is uh, having some road signs up there, turn left, right, and all that? No, not possible. If you wait for your eye to see another plane coming in front of you, you'll be dead and gone by the time you see it, you know. It's not fast enough. So you rely totally on the instruments, right? They say, you know, when you travel, sometimes some of the planes have a camera underneath. When you land, they show, sometimes I see, all I see is cloud, no track, no runway. They say we're landing. And the thing showing how many feet down we are, it shows 1,000 feet and still I can't see it, you know. All, uh, all uh, cloud. But then all of a sudden, just like that, you burst out of the clouds and you see the track. How did the pilot get to the track, exactly on track, exactly on spot, Without the help of this natural eyes, he got there by instruments. Our instrument is this. For a life of faith and victory, for a life of faith and victory, you got to, guide, you got to be guided by instrument. You got, you got to be an expert at this instrument. <laughs> 
you got to know how to follow the guidelines of this instrument. That is how you can make a safe landing. It doesn't matter if the clouds are there. If it doesn't matter, you can't see anything. It doesn't matter because this will take you exactly to the spot and you will land and you will be safe. Everything will work out. Amen. Clap our hands. Jesus name.